Why do people go bald? Why are baboons bums red? What's a light year? Why do leaves go brown in the autumn? Why do monkeys like bananas? Why do some things glow in the dark? Why do animals not understand? Why do minus heat stay after a year? Don't know the answer? Ask the Naked Scientists. Hello and welcome to this week's Ask the Naked Scientists with me, Sue Marchant and Chris Smith. Hello to Tony from Chelmsford. Yeah, hi there, Sue. In the winter, I know that when it's windy, it can reduce the temperature. You get the wind chill factor and the temperatures can plummet. But my question is, if I'm driving along in my car at 70 miles an hour and it shows minus two on the uh, temperature gauge on my car for the outside temperature, is it in fact not minus two because I'm creating my own wind chill factor by doing 70 miles an hour? Oh, that's a very good question. The answer is that when you have these sensors, there are two things. One of them is that they're not exposed to the wind itself because otherwise that would give a misleading uh, measure. In fact, they're in an area of the car which is shielded, so they've not got, got the wind rushing past the sensor. So in other words, they're equilibrating with the outside. And the other point is that they are calibrated so that the driving conditions can compensate for the temperature reported by the temperature sensor. At least if you've got a good car, that's how you do it. And that's what they do in aeroplanes. So when you switch on the thing on an aeroplane that says outside, it's minus 80 degrees. Uh, in fact, someone, it's not because there's someone out there with their arm out the window and a <laughs> thermometer in their hand measuring the temperature of the air going past, because as you say, that would lead to a, a misrepresentation of the real temperature. In fact, what you do is you calibrate your temperature measuring device so that you know what the real temperature is relative to the speed that you're doing at the time. So, And you also shield the thermometer or the temperature measuring device, whatever you're using, from the outside air so that you get an ambient air temperature. Um, that, that's, that's effectively the way it works. Um, I mean, there are, there are various other ways of doing it, such as um, some cameras, some systems actually look at the road surface and they can measure the infrared coming off the road. And by measuring the intensity of the infrared, in other words, heat that's coming off the road, they can infer what the road surface temperature is. And that's obviously an accurate measure because that isn't subject to the movement of the vehicle. So, and that also means that they can tell whether the surface of the road is freezing or not, which is how these things that are ice sensors tell you that, that you should slow down and drive carefully because the surface surface might be frosty, they're, they're doing that by watching the temperature of the surface of the road using the infrared radiation it's reflecting off. OK. Can I just ask you another question on the same topic? Is If it is minus five outside, then it gets very windy. How can the temperature drop when it's only minus five? It's just the wind is pushing it along. Do you get a drop in temperature with wind? How do you get a wind chill effect? Well, the yeah. answer is that temperature is energy. In other words, when something is hot, it's because the atoms in that, that hot thing have got a lot of energy. They're vibrating or moving around with more energy. They're hitting you harder, and this makes them feel hotter. And energy wants to spread out in the universe. It's the rule of the universe that energy in one place, if it's concentrated in one place, wants to spread out and get as spread out as it possibly can. And that means that you as a hot body, and I mean that, in, I don't mean that in terms of you as a hot body, I mean that as in a <laughs> physical phenomenon that's got lots of energy, a hot surface. Surface. You want yeah. to spread your energy out to the environment and the air that comes past you is colder than you are and therefore the energy wants to move down a concentration, not a concentration, it wants to move down a thermal gradient so it spreads out away from you into the colder air. So it's, it's almost as though the colder air is attracting the heat out of you. It's not, it's just that there's a gradient there because it's colder, the hot, lots of energy in one place, not, lo not very much energy in the cold air so it wants to flow from, one, from the place where there's lots of it to where there's not much of it. So if you imagine that the air is still around you, the air is pulling out heat away from you at a certain rate. Well, if you move the air past you, it means that the air can pull the heat away from you even faster because the air that took some heat away from you therefore got a bit warmer and therefore the amount of heat it was trying to pull out of you got less. But if you replace that air very fast with a new bit of cold air, you maintain that very steep thermal gradient pulling heat away from your body and that's what a wind chill factor is. It, it, it effectively makes you lose heat at a temperature as though the temperature were much colder than it really is because the air's moving past you. If the air were still, it wouldn't feel as cold, of course, because you wouldn't have as much air coming past and therefore you wouldn't be losing heat as, as quickly. And so you have to make it proportionally much colder in still air to lose the heat at the same rate. Wicked. That's very good. Thank you. <laughs> Wicked. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks, Tony. Bye. Bye-bye.
Chris, we have uh, quite a few questions coming in here now. This one's from Mike on the text. He says, what causes fungal infection of the tongue and what's the best cure and foods to avoid? Okay, well, the reason people have fungal infections in their mouths is because often something's gone wrong with the immune system or there's something causing the mouth to change its environment so that you get a, a, a sort of immunological, in other words, your immune system allows a loophole so that the organisms can get in there. Now, a common cause of getting something thing in the mouth that sort of fungus wise is yeast infections and candida the same stuff that can cause foot rot and also cause genital infections is a common problem in the mouth and you can recognize when you've got candida in the mouth because it forms a very sore patches with white blobs on the top and this is common in people who use steroids so if you're an asthmatic and you inhale steroids it's always important to swill your mouth out afterwards because the steroids damp down the immune system on the surface of the mouth and this can enable the yeast infection to gain a toehold there and so that if you wash your mouth out when you've inhaled the steroid, then it stops that happening. So that's one possibility. Um, in terms of foods, um, just a healthy diet, because if you don't eat a healthy diet, it's possible that, that your immune system might not work as well as it should do otherwise, and this could lead you, leave you open to infection and colonisation by things. And then there are other rarer causes, um, thankfully rare in this country, but not in some countries, and in diseases that damage the immune system are a common cause of people getting infections with funguses in their mouth and this would be something like HIV for example when patients normally turn up to the doctors in countries like Africa where people tend to present with the disease very late then very commonly they'll have oral candidiasis they'll have candida growing in the mouth and then there are special groups of patients who are people who have to take immune suppressing drugs these are people who for instance have had a bone marrow transplant or an organ transplant and in these people they're taking drugs to damp down their immune system the idea being to stop them rejecting the organ or the bone marrow they've had put into them. And in the same way as the, the person with asthma inhaling steroids, the damping down of the immune system allows certain things like candida to gain a foothold in the mouth. Fortunately, they're very easy to treat because there are some really good drugs around, which things like nystatin pastels that you can get, if you suck those, then it can get rid of the fungus infection. But of course, it's important to treat the cause. And someone who isn't looking after their health very well isn't eating healthily, and, and that means lots of green vegetables and lots of fruit. If you're not eating properly, this can also make you more prone to these kind of things. So that's what to watch out for. All right, hello, Foxy. Dr Chris. Yes, he's there. Hi, Foxy. I, I'm a great lover of nature, and I'm talking about wild oats now. You know, they, they fall to the ground, they crawl along the ground, they spring. How do they manage to do that? I haven't seen wild oats do that. Sounds, sounds terrific, actually. I thought well, I'd I have seen. You. <laughs> well, well, I have seen other plants, which I have weeds actually growing here in my garden. Yes. And th there are a number of weeds which, when you get near them and just brush them or touch them very gently, then they suddenly unleash, almost like a catapult, That's their right. seeds. Which, and you can hear the seeds pinging on the patio and off the glass of the windows nearby. Yes, true, and yes. Plants do this because their aim is to disperse their seeds as widely as possible because if you land your seeds where the plant is, then all of the seeds are going to land there. They'll all end up choking each other and then everything will compete with each other for resources like water and light and carbon dioxide and other minerals in the soil and as a result they won't grow as well. Whereas if they can spread as far and as wide as possible, it's likely that at least some of the seeds are going to land in an even better environment for growing and they're going to do even better. Now the way plants do that is either by exploiting other aspects of nature, so a common way of doing it is you make yourself very tasty and juicy, so that way a bird comes along and eats you. Mm -hmm. The other way you do it is by spring-loading yourself so that when you do get dispersed, you're catapulted out, a bit like the weeds on my patio. And the way that works is that the plants have proteins in the seed casing, which as the seed matures and the plant reckons it's about time to let the seed go, then the casing of the seed dries out and this spring loads the structure so that it's under tension mm -hmm. and then the slightest touch makes it suddenly go and it pings the seed away. It's the right. idea being, of course, to get the seed as far from the parent plant as possible. Yes. Other plants, like poppies, for instance, they just rely on the wind and having very, very light seeds so that when the wind blows the plant, the seeds are brushed out of this little pepper pot at the, stop, at the top and off they go. The wild oats, 
it just amazes me how they do it. And uh, is it temperature or whatever? Or I don't know. Well, it could be. It could be that they have a series of these spring loading in their proteins. Mm. And so as a result, as they're laying on the ground, they're continuously just changing shape. And this makes them move a little bit more. And that gets them as far from the parent plant as possible. But I haven't actually seen the phenomenon. So if you have any pictures you could send me, that'd be great. I'll do you a time frame and send it to you. Well, Chris? if you want to send it to me, chris at the naked scientist.com, and, and then we'll try and get it on the web as well, and then everyone else can appreciate it. Thank you very much for your explanation. Great. Thanks, Thanks Jerry. Good, good to talk to you. Bye. Good stuff. All right, we have uh, another live caller. This time we've got Dave, uh, David from Thurston. Hello, David. Good evening, Sue, oh. and good evening, Dr. Chris. You're through Hi, to David. Chris. My question is uh, concerned with flying aircraft. And uh, as I understand, the principle of flying with birds and everything is that the wings are broader on the top than they are underneath, causing the airflow to, you've got lower pressure on the top to give uh, lift. Yes, that's, that's right. What happens then when, when aircraft fly upside down, inverted, if you <laughs> Well, you know, it's a very interesting point because I was looking the other day into whether things like jumbo jets can do loop the loops. Well, the answer is you're 90% of the way there with, you, with your initial explanation, which is that when you have the shape of an aeroplane wing, it's generating lift because as the air hits the surface of the wing, it's directed upwards and over the surface of the wing. And there's a phenomenon which was discovered by Henri Coanda. And he was, a, I think it was a Romanian scientist working about 100 years ago. He was interested in, in flight. And he discovered this thing called the Coanda effect, which is that where you have a curved surface, as air flows over that curved surface, it wants to stick to the curve. And so any fluid behaves in this way, and that includes liquids like water or gases like the air. Things will follow a curved surface. So air follows the curved surface of the wing, and it's directed downwards underneath the wing, and slightly less far downwards on the sur upper surface of the wing, and this leads to a drop in pressure, effectively creating the lift that you talk about. Now, when an aeroplane flips over, exactly how it manages to maintain lift for long enough, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'd need to look into that, but it's an interesting question. Some of these aircraft that you see these days, especially the little uh, acrobatic ones, I mean, they perform some uh, crazy stunts. I don't know how they manage that. but uh... Well, I think it's part of the skill of the pilot because what they're doing well, is yeah, reconfiguring yeah, the aircraft because there are other things that can be tweaked to, to, to alter the shape of the wing to give it the right attitude and the right structure and shape so that it does maintain lift in other configurations and other forms of flying. Perhaps there are some amateur or professional stunt pilots listening who could phone in and, and help us out with exactly how you configure your wing to enable you to perform those amazing feats. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Thank you, take care. Yeah, too. Dr Chris, Bill from Cambridge asks, why with all the millions of gallons of water covering most of the world, why is there a shortage of fresh water? Well, it's all down to where the water is. It, it's a... A common problem in fact where you have lots of people living and they're consuming a lot of water there's not enough to go around the water cycle the hydrological cycle is the thing that we learn about in school and it's basically what powers rivers and, and streams basically you have the sun beaming energy out into space and it's hitting the surface of the earth so each about square meter of the earth's surface gets hit by energy at the rate of one kilowatt so it's like having a one bar electric fire hitting each square meter of earth's surface and that energy is injected into the ocean where water molecules soak it up and some of the water molecules gain enough energy to break free from the sticky bonds holding them onto other water molecules and they form water vapour and this is evaporation. The water vapour goes up in the air and eventually enough water molecules coalesce together high enough up in the air where the temperature is low enough that they condense together and they form clouds. And air currents then carry those clouds in the direction of land. And when the clouds reach land, inevitably they have to rise in order to sort of go over the top of things like mountains and other higher ground. And because it's much harder for the water, which is now in the form of small droplets and ice crystals, to remain aloft with the cloud rising, some of it inevitably drops as rain. So what you get is where you have a mountainous area, you will have lots of rain. And that's why it rains a lot in Scotland, for example. And then downwind of those mountains, you have a rain shadow area. So here in East Anglia, for example, we live in a rain shadow area because the, the advancing rain comes over a, a, a lot of land, which is a higher elevation, all the rain drops out, and then we're in the drier bit. And that makes it very good, actually, for growing cereal crops, which is why the breadbasket of England is down here in the southeast, for example. 
Now, what this inevitably means is that there will be some bits of the world which are dry because their geography means that they are not in an area which is going to receive large amounts of rain because the rain has already been dropped upwind. And this means that, unfortunately, as the population goes up, there are going to be people living in parts of the world where the amount of rain goes down. And also with climate change, if we follow the models that people who are able to forecast the weather in the long term, if we follow the models that, that they're predicting... What they're suggesting is that the, some bits of the earth are going to get drier and other bits of the earth are going to get a lot wetter. And overall, the amount of, of land which is going to have the right amount of, wet, of rainfall is going to drop. So in the future, we're going to be competing for less land and there's going to be less and less of it and more and more of us. So maybe we'll be fighting over land in future rather than oil. Daniel has sent an email in. He says that in this week's Holby City, one of the doctors was making a speech about the future of medical technology. And he says, I know these things are slightly fictitious, but could a heart really send back information about the condition of itself to a computer on its own? Well, effectively, it already does. Because when we do an ECG or an electrocardiogram on a patient, what we're effectively doing is monitoring the electrical signals that the heart is emitting, the currents that are running over the skin surface due to the heart's activity beneath the surface of the rib cage. And the computer then prints those out on a bit of paper for us. So the heart is, in a way, generating a signal which we can record and we can compare that against what we know is normal. And that tells us whether or even which bit of the hearts are working properly and which bits are not performing properly. Now, to take that to the next extreme, could you actually get a system where the heart could send a signal? Well, it's possible because miniaturised technology now means there are minuscule implantable chips that could, for instance, record the heart rhythm or record other aspects of your biochemistry. There are various measures that people are making now as to how, when you have a certain disease, different chemicals in the blood go up and down. It's not rocket science, really, these days, to be able to produce a gadget which could monitor these things, and it doesn't even have to be connected via a wire. It can actually use electrical and it can use non-connections. It can use radio signals to transmit or beam the information it's collecting out of the body to a collector, and this can then analyse that information and turn it into signals that a computer can understand and then produce printouts that doctors can read. So... I think actually this is not so far away and this concept in near patient monitoring is becoming more and more of a a thing that people want to do. For for one reason, it means that rather than having to put people into hospital for complicated tests, you can do more and more tests and monitoring with people even at home. They don't even have to go and see the doctor. And it also means that you can do remote medicine. You can keep an eye on someone from a long distance using modern technology. For instance, mobile phones can beam data to the nearest mobile phone station and then onwards via the internet, for example, to a health centre. And this could keep an eye on someone and they don't even know they're being checked up on. They're just having a sort of virtual MOT without even realising. Uh, we've got David from Bradwell on the phone. Hello, David. Hello, sir. You're through to Dr Chris. Hello, Chris. Hi, David. Well, the question I'm asking you, Chris, is what is your opinion on the possibility of there being a very advanced technological civilization before the one we know now, going back 7,000 years, shall we say? At the moment, Chris, I'm reading two books it, uh, one is Open Skies, Closed Minds by Nick Poe, and the other one is Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind. And it's going back to so many civilizations years ago. The accounts what they give, Chris, is of people of credible intelligence, uh, police officers, military high-ranking people and, and governmental people and what have you. Uh, and I just wondered, Chris... How you feel? Well, first of all, let's look at this 7,000-year-old figure because that's not quite right. Because what we know about Homo sapiens sapiens, i.e. Yep. us, is yep. that we're a good 55,000 years old yep. and counting. Yep. We yep. probably arose about 155,000 years ago as the right. present species, but we didn't leave Africa. And, in fact, we came from somewhere in northeast Africa about 55,000 years ago. That's, that was where we were effectively born. That was the cradle that modern mankind came out of. What we know about the origin of humans is that about 6 million years ago, we split away from chimpanzees because right. they're our next nearest genetic relative. Right. And we've got quite a good fossil record. It's sparse, but the record is there, mm. connecting us from chimpanzees to then Australopithecines. Right. Australopithecine means yep. southern man. And this yep. is South Africa. There's a lot of specimens there yep. of these 
derivatives of chimpanzees. They're quite small people. They have small brains. They're not yeah. very. They're certainly not as big as modern humans. They have no chin, yeah. and that's how you'd recognise these specimens. But they're certainly not monkeys. They're no. about three million to about one and a half, two million years ago. Yeah. Then two million years ago, they turn into Homo erectus, which is much more similar to us. Yeah. After Homo erectus, they then turn into us. And as well as us, they give rise to other species of humanoid,、yeah. such as the Neanderthals.、Yeah. And what、yeah. we know is that from about a hundred thousand years ago to about five thousand years ago, there were, or maybe twenty thousand years ago, there were about three species of humanoid alive on Earth simultaneously, side by side.、Right. That was us, Neanderthal people that were living across Europe, and they made their last stand down in Gibraltar, actually,、right. and also. The ho- Hobbit people, Homo floresiensis, on the island of Flores, they were around until perhaps、yeah. even the last five hundred years, if、yep. you believe local yep. folklore. Yep. Yep. So there were three species of humanoid living side by side up until very, re- very recently in Earth time.、Yep. And if we did exist as some kind of advanced civilization, then they were very good at covering their tracks because we found examples of our ancestry going back six million years,、yep. and before that, we only find examples of non. Humanoids and earlier animals, much more primitive species, and then dinosaurs. So, where these complex, adventurous civilizations that had this amazing intellect went, I don't know. I'm not saying they didn't exist, no, but no, if no. they did, they were very good at covering their tracks, well, and they my, were very my... careful to leave behind records of what went before them、yeah. or came after them. Yeah, well, as quick as I can, Chris, I, w- I would say to you that there's so many things dating back. First of all, carbon-14 dating is, is something antiquated now, isn't it? There's much better. Dating than that now, and I can't. Well, we're、uh, not really. That goes back about sixty thousand years, right? Yeah,、um, and it's very, very useful. Yeah, but how how do you explain? And and I really is another question. I shouldn't really be asking it, but how do you explain these things that are surfacing now, not just out of the out of the sea, but land as well? That obviously suggest, for example, the pyramids. Math, the best mathematicians in the world today cannot. Say how those pyramids were built. What they do say is that if it was built by the manpower that is suggested, they would still be building them today, which suggests. Somebody somehow knew anti-gravity and could lift massive weights and, and form them how they wanted to do. I think we're underestimating the resolve and determination of our ancestors, because people did do amazing things, and the pyramids. I don't think would require any kind of anti-gravity machine to build them. I think that there is quite good models of how you could build the pyramids using manpower. But yes, you're right. A lot of manpower. It took someone very charismatic to persuade a hell of a lot of people <laughs> to to build the pyramids, and they did a very good job. But、yeah. you know, don't underestimate the power of the ancients because Archimedes worked out some pretty good science two thousand years ago in ancient Greece,、uh-huh. and you know we're still using the mathematics he developed today. Yeah, of course. Yeah, David, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, bye. Oh, Doctor Chris, lots of questions tonight.、Uh, Lucy has sent an email in. She says, as we approach the summer solstice, could you ask just how much nearer we are to the sun than we are at the winter solstice? That's a Dave question with his big calculations, isn't it? <laughs> well, why do we have solstices? Well, the answer is that the Earth, although it's a ball in space, it doesn't actually sit directly upright. If you imagine north and south, it's actually at an angle, so the Earth is tilted over a bit, and that tilts about twenty-three and a half degrees. And what this means is that as we go around the Sun, on some aspects of our orbit, the northern part, the northern upper hemisphere of the Earth, is tilted in the direction of the Sun, and on the other half of the orbit, it's pointing away from the Sun. And why this makes a difference is nothing really to do with how close the the Earth is to the Sun, because the Earth tilt is minuscule compared with the Earth-Sun distance in total. It's in fact the tilt of the Earth affecting how long the day is in the affected hemispheres, and it's the length of the day that determines how much solar energy, heat from the sun, hits that bit of the Earth for how long, and therefore that affects the overall temperature. And that's why we have hot times, summer. And cooler times, winter. Now the equation is slightly, or the mixture is slightly confused by the fact that there are these other things called Milankovitch cycles. Now Milankovitch worked out that when the Earth goes around the Sun, it doesn't do it in a perfect circle, and it doesn't do it in a perfect ellipse. It, it does it in a kind of wobble. So over the course of thousands of years, the Earth's orbit changes very subtly, and it gets a little bit further away, a little bit closer to the Earth, a little bit further up to the Sun, a little bit further away, and also the Earth's tilt. 
changes very slightly over time. It has what's called precession. So the tilt isn't always 23 and a half degrees. And when you sum all of these different wobbles and wiggles together, you arrive at this pattern of changes which occur... Um, a Milankovitch cycles are about 150,000 years. And this, this matches on to why the Earth gets hotter and colder over time and why we have ice ages and warm spells. So it's, it's all to do with partly the attitude of the Earth pointing towards the sun, giving us our seasons year on year, but the long-term climate and hot and cold aspects of the Earth's behaviour are all to do with how these vectors and how these parameters change very subtly every year. Right, another one from Gus here by email this time. Now that scientists have discovered that human memory can also work forward and that it can also stimulate future events in an ever-changing environment rather than viewing it as a mere storehouse of facts and autobiographical data, do you think that Alice in Wonderland was quite futuristic when the Queen explains to Alice it's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards? Yeah, it's quite funny that, isn't it? She <laughs> says, I'm going to prick my finger in a minute, doesn't she? Yes. I remember that when Alice is, is through the looking glass. But I don't think scientists have proved that you can influence your future by making things around you happen by the power of telekinesis or something. You can certainly make your own luck and you can certainly make yourself successful by anticipating what's going to happen next and try and put it, and putting yourself effectively, to take a sort of sport example, you put yourself in the position of where you think the ball is going to come over the net next so you can hit it back and that's all about reading the road ahead. Um, but I'm not convinced that we're in any way in a position to affect outcomes via anything other than just planning ahead. Um, but the, the brain is an amazing thing. I think when people say it's the most complicated thing in the universe i thoroughly agree we just don't understand how the brain works people understand how individual bits of it seem to do what they do they understand how the motor system helps you to control when you speak what bits of the body you move they understand how the sensory system decodes sensory signals coming in from the environment we understand a bit about how the visual system takes what we're seeing from our eyes and builds it up into a picture but what we can't comprehend is how all of those individual things all of those units and modules are plugged together to produce consciousness. No one can solve that. We don't understand what consciousness is, for example, and we don't understand how it works. And so we don't even understand whether an animal is conscious or whether this is something which is unique to us. And those are the kind of big questions that it's going to be really exciting to answer with better science as we move forward from here. And I think one of the intriguing things that's happened in the last six months or so is that scientists have developed systems now where you can watch patterns of brain activity and physically decode what someone's thinking or even what they're seeing. And there was a paper published in America about six months ago. It was in the journal Science. And what researchers did was to put, put uh, subjects in a, an MRI scanner. That's a magnetic resonance imaging scanner. And they got them to look at photographs. They started looking at photographs that they had seen and they trained them on. And they started looking at how these how the brain waves changed or how the brain's activity changed when they looked at certain photographs. And they used this to train a computer to recognise specific aspects of brain activity when the person looked at certain aspects of these photographs. And then they started showing the, pe the people in the experiment photographs that they'd never seen before, recording their brain activity, and then getting the computer to predict which from a whole battery of different photographs the person must be looking at. And the computer was able to read their brain waves and pretty accurately in these two subjects work out what they must be looking at and scientists have done something similar recently where they've actually been able to work out what words someone is saying or what words they're thinking of using just by looking at the pattern of their brain activity and this means we're really beginning to probe now how the brain is generating thought processes and I view this as really exciting because we're in a position where we can start to really dissect out how the brain not, not just plugs together and wires together but how that wiring actually generates this thing we call consciousness which which, to be honest, no one can explain at the moment. That's it for this week. Our doctors will be back with me next week for more Ask the Naked Scientist. But don't forget you can also catch them on the Naked Scientist podcast, which you can find on the Naked Scientist website, www.nakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientists are sponsored by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientists.com. <laughs>